Exodus chapter 3. Exodus chapter 3. Still very familiar verses. <laughs> Exodus chapter 3. The Bible says, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush, and he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burned. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet. For the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you once again for your word. How much of a comfort it has been, down, been to us down through the years. <clears throat> we recognize, Lord, that it's a living word and it meets our every need. God, we pray that you would bless it even unto yourself, and we give you the praise for it, for it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, uh, some somewhat, again, very familiar verses of Scripture, and we'll be preaching this morning on the thought, you are never alone. Never, ever alone. And while that can be a great peace on one side, it can be very humbling on the other side. Because truly, you are never, ever alone. Right. And you know the history of Moses as well as I do, and for what brought him to this specific place in his life. Uh, he was uh, saved carnally, preserved fleshly as a man. Uh, his mother hid him among the bulrushes and preserved his life. And then Pharaoh's daughter uh, found him, had compassion on him, and his mother was hired even to nurse him. Now, all along the way, I have no doubt that his mother taught him the things of God, that taught him the Jewish way, taught him uh, what it was to be a servant of God. Now, she could not teach him the things of the law because they did not yet exist. She had to teach him concerning uh, the person of God. Now, I also want you to see that Moses had religion, but he didn't have redemption. Now, that is the status of many who claim Christendom today, is that they have religion, because he was a very good Jew, but he did not have salvation. And we will find, you know, the life of Moses better than me when he was of age. He refused to be called the son of Pharaoh, which was very significant because monetarily that would have been a great thing because he would have been in line of the throne of Egypt. Now, that looks good, does it not? I mean, that seems noble to be uh, counted among the poor in the, in the land of Goshen than take the throne of Pharaoh. And, and it was noble but he wasn't redeemed. And then a little bit later, he shows his true colors and he, he sees a Egyptian soldier messing with a woman. He strikes him and kills him and buries him and hides him. And then he finds that he's found out. And, uh, and, this, and the, the uh, Jew or the Egyptian, I can't remember which, said it said, uh, you think you're so good, but I, I seen what you done. I know what you done. He showed his true colors. So Moses, even though he was selected from time past, he was not yet redeemed. That's an elect. That's someone predestined to salvation, but they've not been experienced. They've not had the salvation experience. And sometimes sovereign gracers just want to take that out of the equation. Listen, you can't. If you do that, uh, you're no more than a primitive Baptist. And so we find in this situation, 
that Moses needed something of an experience. Again, I'll point to you, and we'll get there in a minute, that he had religion, but he didn't have redemption. He knew of God, but he didn't know God. Because notice whom he, who he's with, the priest of Midian. Now, what office did not yet exist in the Jewish culture? The priestly office. Why? Because the law didn't exist, right? So this priest of Midian was a pagan. I don't know what God he served. I don't know whom he served. But I know, I know it wasn't the great God Jehovah. And, and so he is shut up. He is hooked up. He's married to the daughter of a worldling, uh, of an idolater. And, and there he is in this horrible situation. And you know what? He may have been hiding from Egypt, but he wasn't hiding from God. And so we pick him up right there in, in the first verse of chapter 3. <clears throat> now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law. Now, I want you to see, in a minute, we're not, we're going to find out that Moses ain't even good at what he does. Uh, he was a shepherd, and everybody kind of uses that as what his training was in the future. But where did he have these sheep? On the backside of the desert. In the desert, what's not there? Grass. So he wasn't even good at that. It's a wonder poor old Jethro's sheep didn't starve to death and thirst to death because he didn't know what he was doing. You know what? When God always has your eyes on you, <laughs> he knows when you're in the wrong spot at the wrong time. Yeah. He always knows that, and we find that that is the situation <clears throat> in which Moses was living, and I don't know, the, the best I understand by this point, he had done this, walked around in circles out of, out of God's will for 40 years. And that is, the, that is the condition of many today. And so we find him in that situation. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert, the end of verse 1, and came to the mountain of God, even into Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. Now, this event wasn't that noteworthy in and of itself because there were brush fires that were spontaneously uh, erupted like in all deserts, even here. But the key to the thing was that the bush was not consumed. Right. Uh, the, the, uh, the extraordinary thing was that the fire did not consume. You ever think about before the Lord truly saved you that it's an amazing thing that he didn't consume you in his wrath like that? Because you was on fire and you just weren't consumed. Uh, you, 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 you was good as burned up, but because of his mercy and grace, he didn't do it. So again, Moses not being the best shepherd that ever was, he said, I'm going to take a look at this thing. Now, in the world's mind, what should he have done for those sheep? Got him out of there, right? And she, in addition to storming to death, none of them are going to be burned. And so, but he makes this decision that he's going to go look. <clears throat> and Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he, and he said, here am I. Now, I think it's remarkable here because, again, he had this Jewish life, as it were, pre-law days, and he didn't know God. He had no clue of who was even speaking to him. And the reason why I'll show you first, God has to do the introduction, and then when he gets in the presence of God, he has a sinner's reaction. 
That, 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 that is what is significant here about no, Moses. This is the time the Lord in his mercy and grace saved him. And from this day forward, he would ever, uh, ever more be different and he, he would be changed and he would be doing what God called him to do. Verse 5, and he said, draw not not hither, this is God speaking, and he said, draw not not hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Uh, this is the abode of God. Verse 6, moreover he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Now the reason I say he never, even though he'd been religious, he had never tasted the sweetness of the Lord God of heaven is God had to introduce himself. Isn't it a wonderful, gracious thing? You remember when the Lord introduced himself to you? You were laden with sin. You were just as wicked as Moses was, running from the will of God, running from the person of God. You were just as much of a murderer as he is. And then there, God comes on the scene. That's true grace. That's experiential salvation. That's one when you can lay your head down at night and sleep like a baby because it is the goodness uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and the security that is found in God but not found in man. So God has to introduce himself to one that supposedly had served him prior to. The end of verse 6. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look upon God. And again, that's why uh, another key point that he was not redeemed prior to this is because he was fearful. And, and you know, uh, I've been saved for years, but it is a fearful thing to think about looking on God. But I'm going to look on him one day and enjoy the, and, and enjoy the magnificent sight by the mercy of Christ. In the person of Christ, I look forward to it. Yeah. Now, I want you to see also years later, serving the Lord for many, many, many faithful years, his attitude becomes the opposite. Remember when he's on the mount of God receiving the law. What did he, what was his desire? He said, oh, if I could just see you. And he said, no man can see me and live. Here we find him hiding his face. And 40 years later, that's all he thinks about. And, and, and so we find what, what, what the key is <clears throat> was his years of experience of getting to know him. And, and God says, no man can see me and live. And he didn't care. He was okay with it. He preferred to see God than have life itself. Now, that took years and years and years and years in the making. But if you're genuinely redeemed, as the, year go, the years go by, you will crave him more and more. And if you don't, there's some sin in your life that needs to be dealt with. Right. And, and, and so we find that Moses being uh, born again in the sense that he was in the Old Testament... He was very much craving the person of the Lord God Almighty by the time his life drew near unto its end. That is the hallmark of a believer. That, that is someone that is genuinely saved. Now, you know the rest of this chapter that God calls him to do a great work. Like all newborn Christians, he says, I can't do it, I can't speak. I don't have a good voice. And on and on he went. He says, you can't speak, I'll give you Aaron. And, he, uh, and, and so he goes through with it. And you see what a mess Aaron became. Uh, he, it, it wasn't so for, from the beginning. But you know, we all start out kind of little rough around the edges, do we not? That's one problem with Baptists today. When someone's a newborn baby, we need to take a, teach, treat them like that. Amen. We need to encourage them. You know what? Uh, all our kids, when they was learning to walk, they busted their face more than once. Now we didn't say, oh, you're never going to walk. We picked them up, dusted them off, kissed them a little bit, and sent them off on their way again. That's what we have to do. We have to be there for them. 
<clears throat> during this time. And so we find that Moses has a genuine, genuine experience with Christ, but he was never alone. All through, uh, all through his ministry that lie ahead. You remember uh, uh, one time, I, and I can't remember, I think they were wanting water, and Moses and Aaron said, they're going to be ready to stone us. Right. He said, get up. You know, it's a hard thing when you think your life's in jeopardy and all God says to you is, get up. You're going to go smite a rock and water's going to come out of it. <coughs> he was winning then too, was he not? And he wasn't stoned. The water did rush forth. And again, years later, same scenario, and he was so mad at God's people, he hit the rock again. Now that kept him out of the promised land. But you know, he wasn't mad for himself. He was mad at his people for doubting God, doubting his provision, doubting what he's able to do. And so he struck the rock again. In all those experiences, God was with him again and again and again and again. And that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Any trial that you have upcoming, God's with you. Yeah. He's present. You may, you know, you may not. Uh, you may not see him and you may not hear him, but man, he's present. He's there. When I used to teach, at the time of testing, lecture was over. Right? Can't give them that. You know, the, the modern day public school system is to go around and, you got that one wrong, you might want to reread it. No one left behind. That's foolishness, isn't it? You want, you want a nurse taking care of you that graduated from no one left behind? Right? So all I would do, I would go around the room and walk in among my students and I'd say nothing. In your time of testing, the teacher's always silent. Or she should be. And in the same way here, in, in all those experiences, Moses knew that God was with him and always abiding with him in every presence and every need. And he learned that till at the end of his life, he craved God more than he craved, craved life itself. <clears throat> and that is a wonderful, wonderful thought. You know what? If the stones began to fly, God would have still been with him. You know, when Paul died after being shipwrecked, after being stoned, uh, and after being uh, uh, whipped with 39 stripes five different times, you know God was with him in each and every place. What, what a miraculous, wonderful thing to know. But I want to see, show you on the flip side of that in the book of 1 Kings. Uh, 1 Kings. Uh, chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19. And we're going to begin reading in verse 9. 1 Kings chapter 19. Uh, we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Now, another very familiar verses set of scripture. Elijah was on the run. Now, if you know the sequence of events, God had just taken care of 400 prophets of Baal, obliterated them. He had won a great and glorious victory. Now, when you're living in victory, be cautious because trouble's coming. And then that wicked woman Jezebel, one little old woman, uh, all she was was a vessel of wrath. And he, she sent this one little message to him. I'm going to make you like one of them by this time tomorrow. And he believed it. Isn't it amazing what the, some of the stupidness we believe? You know what? The devil cannot touch you unless God authorizes it. If you don't believe that, read the first three chapters of Job and you'll find that it's just so. So if you're under attack of Satan, and I don't even think this would have transpired, but if it was Jezebel's 
idea. And if God had took the hedge about him and it came in that Jezebel had this authority, did he not think God was in it? Well, apparently not. Apparently, he uh, thought he had to take care of it on his own, come up with his own idea, come up with his own things to do. And so that's where we pick him up in verse 9. 1 Kings 19, verse 9, the Bible says, And he came thither unto a cave. Now, Elijah never had much, but he didn't have to stay in a cave before. You ever been in a cave? When I was a kid, I was stupid enough to like that stuff. And, you know, down in a cave, it's dark, it's cold, <coughs> it's musty. No, no, no place where you think that God would abide. But he was there. God just wasn't running from Jezebel. He was running from God. And that's easy to get down on old Elijah and say, well, bless his heart. But you think about the number of times in your life that you have run from God in all different directions. And as foolish as it seems when we think how sovereign and all-knowing our God is, we, everyone, have done it. Trying to hide from the Almighty. And that's all that Elijah was doing. He was on the run, and, and he, he no longer wanted to be fighting for God. We find that he says, I am alone and left. And God said, no, you're not. I have over 5,000 have not bowed their knee unto Baal. See, we, we get pretty isolated sometimes. Think we're the only one left. No, we're not. That's why sometimes I wish y'all could go to some of these conferences with me. You know what? There's not a lot of us left. A lot of churches are just as small or smaller than we are. But you get them all together from all corners of this great nation of ours, there's still a good number out there. A lot that have not bowed their knee to Baal. Yeah. And, and we need to remember that. That will keep you encouraged in, in, in the dark times and in the hard times. And it's so it was here. So Elijah is in this dank, nasty, dark cave in an attempt not just to hide from God, I mean to hide from Jezebel, but to hide from God. Did not want anything of it. And he went in... Uh, excuse me, and lodged there, and behold, the word of God, the word of the Lord came unto him, and he said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Now, <laughs> Elijah did the hem hop reaction. He walked all around the subject, and if you'll, if you'll read this text, he never gives God the answer. And in fact, God answers him, I mean, ask him again in a few more verses down, and he still doesn't give God a straight answer. You, you ever felt like that? You ever felt like, uh, I, don't, I don't have to be accountable unto this? Well, dear friend, you do. You have to answer questions. So he didn't say, how'd you get here, Elijah? He didn't say, what are, what are you thinking, Elijah? So I ask you, like God asked Elijah, what was he doing? Very simple answer. Nothing. <laughs> he was doing nothing on the cause of the Almighty. He was doing nothing. And you know what? He had got those good meals from the angelic being. He was going in the power and the strength of those meals. But what would have happened? Y'all remember all through his life, mostly how Elijah was fed? He was fed by the hand of God. And do you think that he would have got that up in a cave on top of a mountain somewhere? Absolutely not. <laughs> so we find that Elijah does not answer the question. He thought he was uh, safe. He thought he had had physical safety from the world, but he didn't. He thought he had run and he was 
was hid and he was and he was <coughs> concealed from Eli, I mean from Jezebel. But he wasn't. Yeah. See, God knows where you were at. See, Jezebel did not know where Elijah was out, but God did. He knows where we're at spiritually. He knows where we're at financially. He knows where we're at physically. God knows. So, you know, and we say, well, how Elijah, such a, such a great prophet of his day, how could he be so foolish concerning God? Well, we do the same thing. We, we think we can hide from God. And, and usually our approach is this. Well, I just don't see it that way in the Scripture. Well, let me tell you, dear friend, it doesn't matter what you see in the Scriptures. It's what the Scriptures teach. Right? We've got to see it God's way. And, and, and so we find that in this situation that <clears throat> Elijah was out of the will of the Lord, he was in rebellion to God in that sense, and he was about ready to quit. Now, verse 10, the Bible says, and he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword, and I, even I alone, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. Now, I want you to see the reason this is significant. Number one, he got him out of hiding, or what he thought was hiding. <laughs> you don't hide from God. He says, you're going to stand at the front of the cave, and me and you're going to have a talk. You know, whatever you think you're hiding from, you just need to come out of the cave. Whatever, whatever you think you have hidden, whatever you think is secret, just come out of the cave. Just stand before the Almighty. Uh, just uh, uh, as the old going, uh, as the old saying the old saying goes, just fess up. Uh, ju just become accountable because you know, despite what you may think, you are accountable. Most certainly, you're accountable for your own life and 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 it, and its service unto the Almighty. Verse 11, and he said, Go forth and stand upon the mount before the Lord. <clears throat> and behold, the Lord passed by, and a great strong wind rent the mountains and break it and break in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. And, so, and it was so when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entering of the cave. And behold, there came a voice unto him and said, What doest thou here, Elijah? <laughs> Isn't it aggravating from the flesh when you hear the same old message again and again and again and again and again and again? Well, poor old Elijah went through the same thing, didn't he? Apparently that's the nature of our God, right? And you know when he quit doing that, when God quit preaching the same message to him, is when he was obedient. When he did what God wanted him to, he got back down there. And you know old Jezebel met her demise too. She, uh, she got her come up and the dogs ate her body. See, uh, what you don't need to be concerned about is how sinners are going. That, that's none of your affair. All you have to do is give them the gospel, and that's, all, that's, that's your only obligation to them. Don't let the world suck you in. Right? Because that's, that's really what was happening in the life of the life of here. He began to believe the sinner's uh, comments rather than God. And so we know that despite running from God, despite from hiding from God, God was still there. He's an ever-present entity. You are never alone, even when, even when you're sinning. Now, the last place in the book of Acts, 
Acts chapter 23. Acts 23, and we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Acts 23, and beginning in verse 9, the Bible says, And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man. Now, if you know your scripture, you'll find that this event occurred and there was some dissension in the group that wanted to come out against Paul. And the Lord God used that dissension and Paul used that dissension and even made it worse, really, uh, to his own benefit. And, and, and he was saved from this situation. God was with him. There was wisdom in what was happening. We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel have spoken to him, let us not fight against God. So they, they were okay if this was a preaching man, if this was a man called of God, we'll listen to him. <clears throat> and when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him by force from among them, and to bring him into the castle. Now, I want you to see the work of the Almighty showing again and again and again. You are never alone. Christian friend, your preservation is there. So, <clears throat> the very one that was brought as an accuser against him, the very judge of the place, sent people to his rescue. Yeah. Is that not our God? Is that not what he is? You're not alone. And if you're being arrested and pulled into pieces, it's for your benefit and your good. And you know the rest of the story? He's taken up into a high tower, a place of safety, a place of goodness by the very hand of God. Now, this is when we get discouraged. He was safe, but he was alone. <laughs> Or he thought he was. He, he, he was in a good spot physically, but had to be lonely up there. You ever get lonely? Difficult time, man. Well, listen, you're not by yourself. You may, you may have convinced yourself you are, but you're not by yourself. But we find in verse 11, the Bible says this, on the night following. Now, if I understand the Jewish time clock and calendar, that would have meant the next night. Not the night that evening, because he, he, was, he was thrown up there probably about three in the afternoon. <coughs> it was all that day, all that night, or I guess I should say since it was three, all that night, all the next day, and on the night following is what the scripture says. That evening, the following night, that, that gives you 36 hours, he probably felt alone. He was learning the character of God. He had just been saved probably three, four years before this event. And now he's up there, locked up in the, in, in the tower, and it says on the night following, God comes by and whispers in his ear, say, be of good cheer, Paul. You will also preach of me at Rome. It's not your time yet. See, we shouldn't dread the times alone. We should look forward to them, because we're not alone. Now, you may be like him. You may wait 36 hours. You may wait more than that before he comes by and whispers in your, your, your ear something good and encouraging. But he will. But he will. So if you think about that this morning, about things are good. I'm not alone. Don't let the devil steal that from you. You're not alone. Maybe if you're out in sin, that's a gloomy thought. 
I'm not alone. The secrets of my heart is known before God. I'm not alone. See, it all depends on where you're at, don't it? I rejoice in the fact I'm never alone. Now, these last flights were not bad. Uh, it certainly wasn't bad like the last when I came back in, in that storm. Not this time, but I guess it was last year. But the planes were delayed, especially going out there. And <clears throat> I was frustrated. We get frustrated so easy. And I've seen men are more geared like this than women. You know why that plane was delayed? Because it was authored of God and it was part of his plan. So what am I grumbling against it? Maybe if I'd have been up there when it was scheduled, it collided with another plane. It was for my benefit and for my good. But again, on the, on the other side, if you're lost, he knows it. If you've never really been born again, he knows it. He knows exactly where you are.